All right, guys. Um, today we're going to be talking about the state of the market, and we prepared a really uh, all-encompassing presentation, hitting this from not only a sales perspective, but also what's happening in the rental market, what's happening in the mortgage market. Uh, if Elaine joins, she's going to enlighten us on what's happening in title and what's going on down at City Hall. All of us want to know about that. So um, I am one of the co-leaders of Grid Philly. I'm Matt Green. You all know Todd Miller. <clears throat> um, Connor Riley from Washington Tap Capital Partners is joining us, um, as well as Ryan Harsh from My City Mortgage. I'm sure Elaine will be Lane Miller from Keystone Title, who's also a sponsor, will be jumping in as well. Um, so I wanted to start by sharing my screen with you guys and giving you just kind of a brief history lesson on real estate markets, which I think will be interesting for you guys. Can you guys see this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so this is called the Case-Shiller Index. Case-Shiller actually tracks real estate prices and markets in the U.S. has been doing so, as you can see, back into the 1800s. Um, this particular graph is adjusted for inflation. So obviously in you know 1900, the average sale price was not $120,000. That's an adjusted number. But what I find interesting about this graph is a couple of things. First of all, the obvious, you don't see the graph starting from here and going straight up to here. Um, real estate markets fluctuate just like all free markets fluctuate. And if you were really to zoom in on this graph, you would see that these market cycles tend to happen about every five to seven years. Um, the longest upwardly trending cycle we had was from 2001 to 2008. You can see the crash there. And we're now in officially the longest upwardly trending market going into 11 years of an upwardly trending market. Um, and so what goes up must either level out or come down. Um, so I just wanted to, you know, I'm a visual person. I think it's interesting to just kind of know that these markets naturally fluctuate. It's been happening for over a century and it will continue to happen. If we look at the Philadelphia, anybody, any questions on that guys? Nope. No? Yeah. All right. If we look at the Philadelphia County market, <clears throat> All right, so this is going back to 2012. We were coming out of the recession in 2008. This yellow line represents active inventory. The purple line represents pending sales. So you can actually see the correction occurring. As these lines get closer and closer together, it's representative of a hotter and hotter seller's market. Um, you can see where the peak of the market occurred back in February, February, March of this past year. And it's now gone in the opposite direction. Now, interestingly, last month, both listings went down and pending sales went down. But although I don't have a, a time machine, you know, none of us do, it's unlikely if you go back to the Case-Shiller Index, um, It's not letting me do it, but it's unlikely that those lines are going to cross back over each other again. Um, you know, as I mentioned, market cycles tend to go up and down and they tend to last in periods of five to seven years. So I would personally be very surprised if these lines cross back over again and, and went in the opposite direction. Um, they'll probably continue either to stay, you know, relatively straight or go up like this and down like this. So right now we are in a market correction. Now, obviously, supply and demand relative to each other are still strong. I mean, prices are still high, but if these lines get further and further apart, like they did back in, you know, 13, 12, and 11, you will start to see buying opportunities and downward pressure on pricing. 
Any questions of, from anybody on that? Nope. I have a question. Do you think that Philadelphia is experiencing a market correction first as opposed to the suburbs or is it just that everyone's kind of rushing for the suburbs for more space? No, it's a good question. I mean, I what I can share with you and um, Connor, I'd love your input on this. All the colleagues that I'm talking to that work in cities, Boston, Chicago, DC, Miami, LA, in this city proper is not the suburbs are experiencing the same thing. More inventory, fewer sales. Are you seeing that Connor? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And usually uh, if you wanna go even more on a micro level, this generally occurs first in the condo sales. I fill it regular, please. Uh, yeah, it, the condo market, I mean. It happens first in the condo sales, then it will uh, single family or anything like that. Um, now, from, an, uh, from a, a macro level, we talk to, I, I'm a hard money lender and we'll go into that at a separate time. Thanks. I talk to a ton of um, people in the secondary market that are fluctuating with billions and billions of dollars. Um, and back in 2020, um, there was already a correction happening. You brought up Miami, Matt, in the Miami condo market. Uh, mm -hmm. so now you're going to be seeing that a little bit, uh, a little bit further. Yeah. So, I mean, to your point, Basha, we know what the buying trends are right now. Um, even within Philadelphia County, you know, when you see areas like Mount Airy or like the far Northeast, where people get yards, they get garages, they have places potentially for a pool, the houses are larger, you have places for home offices and flex space. All of those products are doing much better, um, performing much better, selling much more quickly and for more money than condos or even row homes. You know, I have um, investors coming to me saying, oh, I can get a fen phenomenal deal to flip a 700 square foot two bedroom row home, I'm kind of encouraging them not to do that because those are really tough sales right now. Questions, comments? All right, so assuming um, we are headed into a correcting market, I just wanted to no, share thanks. with you guys a, you. Couple, a couple of lessons that I learned from 2008 because I was selling real estate at that time and 2009 and 10 and 11 and 12 and every year after that. Um, and what I learned firsthand is that the best locations tend to be the most resilient from any sort of market correction. Um, so, you know, if we start heading into a market where inventory goes up across the board, the best locations are obviously going to um, continue to perform better. The, what I call the B and C locations will feel, I think, the biggest downward pressure in terms of pricing. So if you are a buyer and looking to hold for a long period of time, those are the opportunities that could potentially pay off in the long run. If you're a seller looking to sell um, and you're in one of those B or C locations and you're thinking you may do this in the next couple of years, now is probably the time to do that. Um, and if you're a buyer looking to flip, you're probably gonna want to flip in a, you know, a more stable, less risky location because if the market does correct in a year or two, those could be more difficult sales. Does that make sense to everybody? All right, the other thing that I wrote down um, in a changing market, if you're trying to um, calculate ARV, you're going to want to take the most recent sales. You know, sometimes we're running comps. We can go back 180 days or even a year. If you can't find comparable sales, the market's changing. I'm always looking at the most recent sales, even pending sales, talking to the listing agents, finding what they're under contract for. Because if the market's changing as we speak, you know, obviously um, a sale that's happened in the, the last 30 days is going to be a lot more relevant than something that happened six or eight months ago. Um, the last thing that I wrote down is, you know, if you are somebody that wants to flip property, you know, again, I'm 
trying to discourage clients from doing things like building three-story houses on blocks where everything else is two-story. Hey, who's making noise here? Eileen, can you mute yourself, please? Who is it? Eileen Miller. Eileen? Yes, sorry. <laughs> Didn't know about Eileen. Um, I am discouraging people from building three-story, for example, like adding a third story on a block where there's only two-story houses. Um, you know, you really want to try to maintain some conformity and consistency with um, with the product that you are um, that you're producing. You know, not trying to build a five hundred thousand dollar house in a neighborhood with two. I had a lowercase c and an uppercase c in my email address. That's why. And Catamusto. Okay. Thank you. So that's what I got. Who has any questions on the market as it relates to buying and selling property? Are you going to clarify the A, B, and C places? A, B, and C locations. Yeah. So, I mean, I think you can all imagine what that looks like. I mean, you know, an A location would be what? In Center City, Society Hill, Rittenhouse Square, Fairmount, Northern Liberties. B locations, you know, locations that are um, a little bit more transitional, um, you know, as you get further out into West Philadelphia from University City or Point Breeze, I would consider to be more of a B location. C locations, I don't know, West Kensington, you know, um, Todd, don't smile. I mean, I don't want to offend anybody here, but, you know, just um, <laughs> if, if, um, you know, if you're looking to flip a property and there are no other renovated properties on the block, like, don't do it. I mean, unless you're getting the house for free. I mean, it's just a risk. You know, I'm always wanting to be able to find at least three or four properties, if not more than that. If a, an investor is asking my opinion to flip that, that look can feel kind of the same that are at the same price point. Otherwise, you know, who knows what will happen when the property's finished and ready to sell. Hey, hey Matt, this is uh, Charlie Kyle. I joined a little bit late. I apologize, but um, I was wondering if you had any advice for someone who's looking to buy and hold uh, their first multifamily in, in 12 to 18 months, or if, if that time horizon even makes sense. I mean, I'll let everybody else chime on this. When I'm thinking of buying and holding, it's not for 18 months. I mean, it's for a much, much longer. No, no, I'm sorry. I, uh, to clarify, buying in 12 to 18 months from now. Versus why would you do that? Um, I don't have the capital currently. Oh, I mean, look, you know, if it's, if you're asking me, is it going to be, are prices going to be more advantageous in 18 months? Maybe. Will interest rates be higher? Probably. There's a lot of different factors, Charlie, that you've got to factor in. But if you don't have the capital right now, then you don't have the capital. It's as simple as that. Hey, Charlie, it's Todd Miller. I don't think we know each other. Uh, and if we haven't met, nice to meet you. Where are you considering your first investment? Hey, Todd. Uh, pleasure to meet you. Um, I'm looking in a couple of what I would consider B locations. Um, I've done some research on uh, potential markets in, um, in and around Philly, but also elsewhere. But I was looking in uh, Norristown, um, as well as potentially even the Lehigh Valley, excuse me, Lehigh Valley, um, East End, or even Phillipsburg, New Jersey. Okay. Uh can't comment too much on the Lehigh Valley, though I do know a handful. I'm happy to connect with them, investors who who buy a lot up there. And I'll, I don't know anybody who buys single family up there. Maybe that's just a condition of their market. But, um, you know, the areas like Norristown and, and even parts of King of Prussia out that way, uh, renter heavy, which is good for multifamily. Uh, I My personal philosophy when it comes to buying and holding is, do you want the cash flow or do you want the appreciation? You got to be pretty confident in what target you're aiming for. And then sure. the, beauty, the beauty is the longer you hold, you'll get both. You just got to know what you want up front. Um, and also, if you want to learn more about the capital and how little you probably need to get started, uh, Connor on this call would be fantastic for that. 
Great. Thanks, Ty. <laughs> yeah, Charlie, uh, I'm actually, uh, I'm, I'm a hard money lender, as I was saying to uh, everyone before you, you joined. Um, so just a little bit about, about, about me, so maybe I can help out with people. Uh, we do anything from single family to uh, multifamily projects in the acquisition construction space, along with 30-year rentals. And, and Charlie, some of the things you're going to want to look specifically for when you're evaluating what type of multifamilies you're going to get in, is this going to be a one through four? unit because that's a residentially um, zoned property or are you going to go uh, five units and above uh, because then that's technically a commercial property and things are taxed differently so a lot of different codes you have to go for um, additionally you'd want to look for are you going to be going for voucher rent so government backed programs um, how are the how are those things coming into you what is the guarantee of those or are you going to be going for market rents all of those things will impact your decision on where to invest, how to invest, and based on how what well Todd said earlier, you're going to be looking for appreciation or the, um, you know, the cash flow. Um, you and I can find a time to uh, go deeper into that uh, at a at a later date. Absolutely. Yeah, so, I, Connor, I appreciate that, guys. And uh, sorry to derail Matt. Um, and no, no, Connor, no, no, no. just for for your information, looking to house hack probably a two to four unit residential. Listen, Love that this is, idea. This is what this is all about. We should all be interacting. So you didn't derail anything. I'm glad you asked the question. So Tal, what do you say to the person that wants both cash flow and appreciation? Um, you sound like I did when I got started. I, yeah, it's hard because you just say go away. Yeah, no, 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 no. I, you know Chris, what I do? Interest I, only. Yeah, yeah, right. There you go. No, tr truthfully, I, 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 you in real estate, this is a red flag, but it all depends on your age, right? I was 27 when I bought my first rental. I didn't care about the cash flow. I wanted the long-term benefit. If you're, I don't know, 85, maybe I wouldn't consider appreciation to be your primary goal. But that, that's how I, I break it down. And I know, hate you, all the heirs to my estate. Screw them. <laughs> you know, I'm going to buy this shitty asset that cash flows great and then just let them deal with it. Uh, yeah, no, that, that really is it. If Depending on what your age is and, and your goal, it, it's not that hard. But I've, I'm of living proof. The longer you hold, you will get both. It just takes a little bit of time. And it's the same as somebody who wants to buy a house and wants, you know, the best yeah. location in a garage and wants to pay $200. I mean, it just doesn't work like that. No. And you know what else is really nice too about buying and holding? Uh, all these things you talk about, like the market goes up, down, left, right. If you're a landlord, if that's your goal, the value of the house doesn't really matter. It can go up, it can go down, but if you're not selling it, you don't have to be concerned about it. And now, sure, you might need to refinance and take leverage, whatever. Those are nuanced issues, but I don't really focus on my property values because I have no desire to sell them. So I think that's a huge benefit for long-term. So you're focusing investment. on the cash flow. No, no. I, well, no. I, now I am, but I wasn't when I started. How much cash flow is enough? I mean, if you get, you know, a really solid location, you know, and assuming that's a great product and all those sorts mm -hmm. of things, you know, what's too little, what's really, what's adequate and what's exceptional? When I started, I would Connor, shoot... Please, anybody chime in on this? Yeah, too. yeah. I'm sorry, Connor, go first, if you don't mind, then I'll... Go I'm sorry, I was, I was responding to one of the chats in there. Can you repeat the question? Yeah, I was saying, you know, just as an educational exercise, if you find a property and, you know, let's say you're, you're paying a fair price, but it's in a great location, it's in great condition, mm -hmm. um, you know, what's adequate cash flow, what's you know, kind of the minimum and what would be exceptional. And unfortunately, that is all based on what you're you're looking for as the individual investor because- That's not the answer that I wanted. I wanted <laughs> a damn answer. The, the, the very, very basic like, answer is that you want to make sure that your monthly income covers every single bit of your debt. Anything on top of that is extra. Yep. And, that, and that's where your cash flow comes from. And, and what that is actually called- um, is a 1.0 DSCR. Um, so yeah, that sure. is something that everyone needs to evaluate. DSCR stands for debt service coverage ratio, which just means how much a month do you have to pay in taxes, insurance, principal and interest, everybody else, and how much are people paying you? If you can find somebody that, um, let's say your, your debt is a thousand bucks and someone's paying you 1500, you're cash flowing 500 bucks a month. That is the simplest way to look at everything like that. Now you have to decide how much do you want to cash flow? 
Um, and that's how you pick what deals you go into. Yeah, and well, I actually, I, I only um, value investment properties, rentals as um, a cap rate because I always value it. Where can I get a better return? And if the better return is in the stock market, I wouldn't be putting it into real estate. I never look at the appreciation. That's actually something I would be willing to do if the area was super, was very special. But I always look at a cap rate and for basically I won't do anything that's below a 6% cap rate, which I consider to be a great return for a 6% cap rate. Um, anything below that I wouldn't, I wouldn't bother with unless there was some special reason for appreciation. So I always base it off that the higher, the better, but 6% money. I can't, I can't speak to the traditional cap rates in the Philadelphia area. However, if you were in DC, um, you would have a hard, hard time finding that cap rate here. It's now, yeah. very difficult to find that cap rate. Yeah. It's, 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 all, it's all based on your location and, and the type yeah. of renter that you're going to be having. So um, if you look, if you're evaluating things on a cap rate basis, um, you have to understand that the higher the cap rate, generally the riskier the, the renter. Right. right, or you just buy it at from a wholesaler or at a really good price because I, I or the better that. the listing agent. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I, I evaluate yeah. mine. So yeah, <laughs> or like you you make your money when you buy at that, mm -hmm. that price. So it's in this market, it's really difficult to find that, especially if the property's on the market or if you're not rehabbing it and and adding the extra value. Yeah. I hear what you're saying, Basha. Although, you know, I, I think it, it, it would be short-sighted to completely ignore the appreciation aspect. And I'll tell you why. I have clients that, you know, owned condos, were cash flowing just fine, you know, bought them in 2003. And then they come in 2020 for me to list them. And they're asking why they're not making any money at all, or in some instances, losing money. So, you know, it, I think it's, you got to look at, at both and then make that determination in terms of what your longer term goals are. Um, so with all that said, Todd, I know that you came prepared with some information um, about the rental market. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I, uh, I, I'm really excited to share this and get feedback because uh, the majority of my business is, is buy and hold. Uh, last year, we, when I say we, I mean my wife and I, we added five single family rentals to our portfolio, which was our goal. We're thrilled about that. This year, we're looking to add five buildings, but do our first multifamily. Uh, a little intimidated by that, never done it, but hey, you know what? Got to start somewhere. Um, I'm seeing three things that I want to talk about today in no particular order. One, and I know this is obvious, and we all hear it, but the cost of construction is making it. I don't want to say impossible, but Hard. pretty pretty yeah. close to the buy, renovate, pull all your money out, go on to the next. So um, we can talk about that and how much uh, my opinion and, and Connors and everybody else is of leaving money into deals, uh, which is a, not spending, it's an investment, right? You got to trick your brain to believing that. Um, two is just the contractor world in general. Uh, I've gone through quite a bit of vetting of contractors and then hiring and then firing and rehiring and I'm sorry, not rehiring, just bringing in contractors a second time to finish up work. That's one, that's another problem. And then the third is location. So when I look at Matt's chart of housing prices and whatever, it, it almost is, and I said this earlier, almost completely irrelevant on the buy and hold side because as an, as an investor, I want to be on the fringe area. I don't want to be on the leading edge. I almost prefer to be on the, the bleeding edge in that example. And it's a completely different method of, yeah, I understand I'm going to buy a shell at X and I'll put in Y. It'll be worth Z. I'll get my money out. That's great. But if I'm making two or 300 bucks a month in rent and then it's going up in value over time slightly, and then the rents go up, the debt goes down, your cash flow gets bigger. That's the system working. So Anybody want to comment on cost of construction and contractors before we talk about some locations? I'm ready to kill all mine. That's all I can. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, I, I will say, um, I just saw a chart kind of skimming. 
Um, I saw a cost of lumber going back up again. Yeah. That's not going to change anytime soon, uh, in my personal opinion. Um, so I think that this is the unfortunate reality that we all have to get accustomed to, which just means that everyone needs to work a little bit harder on the buy side to find deals off market um, because there's going to be a higher cost of construction. Um, in addition to that, trades are, are being less and less, which just means that people can charge more and more. Um, well, if you can get a, if you can get a solid understanding of what things should cost for yourself, you'll find ways to save money with your contractor. So Connor, to you, you're, you could not be more accurate. The, the one thing as a landlord, as an investor, you can control is what you pay for the building. That is completely in your control. You can say no, you can negotiate harder, whatever. Um, I'm buying a 1200 square foot building in Grace Ferry and I'm spending $12,000 on framing. And like, like two years ago, that would have cost me, I don't know, five grand maybe because the contractors aren't stupid. They're opportunists. You're paying more for lumber. And now we're going to juice you on the labor. And what am I going to say? No, like I have to do it. So yeah, it's, it's, it's brutal, but um, yeah, I agree. You can become a better buyer, myself included. Anybody else feeling that with not just lumber, but everything and finding skilled tradesmen or women to actually do the work? Well, I, I'll say this. I mean, hopefully we won't have to deal with this for much longer. Famous last words. I was thinking that a year <laughs> ago, but um, I'm doing a major construction project and almost every crew has gotten COVID at one point in time. And it's delayed yeah. the project now, like it gets delayed a week, the flooring yeah. people, and then, you know, everybody else. So hopefully, you know, I would just, my words of wisdom would be um, expand the time frames that you think these things are going to happen in, um, you know, by one and a half because things are taking longer too. Uh, in addition absolutely. to supply chain. <clears throat> absolutely. It's taking me 10 weeks just to get windows in some of these buildings. And that doesn't even have to do with what Matt's great point was. So yeah, I, I firmly uh, support that. One, uh, one trick uh, I've learned to kind of help with costs is that you go buy the materials, drop it off on site and have your GC complete everything. That does definitely um, involve you a little bit more and a little bit of labor intense for yourself. Uh, but there's could be thousands of dollars of savings if you're the one that's gonna be going to find those things. Yeah, the, uh, I've never done that before until the most recent job I'm working on now. And the other day I rented that like $20 an hour thing from Home Depot and I dropped windows and doors off. And I was looking at the quote versus what I paid. And it was like, I don't know, $800 difference, not the end of the world when you're spending $100,000, but you do that two or three times and you're five grand over budget, that could be your answer. So yeah, I, I agree. Um, I want to talk if, if people right, what are else, Yes. What are you seeing? And Sean, you might be able to comment on this. Are you seeing uh, any changes in the quality of tenants, um, you know, or I don't know. Tenant behavior, are things taking longer to rent? Is there more demand, less demand? <laughs> Sean, do you want to answer that before I give my opinion? I think there's definitely seasonality involved as well. You know, the peak rental season is from April to like August, September. Uh, there, with schools reopening, universities reopening, and not only the direct students, but there's also, you know, the staff, the uh, professors, and so forth. So, as compared to 2020, 2021, I guess this is speaking of, of rental season because we're not there yet in 2022, there definitely was an increase. Uh, even within like like Center City where Temple students, Penn students, art students around here. Um, as far as the young professionals, the young professionals, uh, the, the millennial age that have the salary jobs who are paying, you know, like well over 2,000, 2,200 to live in like center city or in a high rise, they don't want to pay that anymore with the interest rates. You know, they were at like 3.0%, even now 3.1%. They'd rather live in uh, like Point Breeze or, you know, be, basically they're priced out of the city, but they would rather have home ownership in the desire of more space because if they're salary workers, they're more likely going to work from home at least a couple of days a week. Uh, or uh, I actually had a couple that they both worked from home. They bought their home before the pandemic. Uh, they're both salaried employees. And they're, uh, they're actually going to a separation because they, 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 they can't stand each other. So I guess uh, in the long term, the, uh, 
rent to market has increased, but it also is making those who are salaried employees desire more space and, and use their buying power. Thank you. I have a, a comment about the rent to market. So historically what I'm used to is it being completely dead right now um, up until March, April. And I just had a rental listing in mid December and had a ton of interest and so the lease was signed within two days. I just listed another one um, yesterday, eight showing requests for today. It just seems like the rental market is on fire um, here in Philly and in the suburbs. The, the houses I'm referring to are just in Philly, but in the suburbs, I've been hearing the same thing from investors that they're, they are just able to charge much higher rents and they have so much interest and the um, units and houses just get um, rented out really quickly for much higher prices. People are looking for more space at the end of the day. Um, that, that's really what it is. People are just ready, to, ready and willing to move um, because they're in their areas more. Um, now, whether that's renting or buying, that's all really is, is personal opinion. But if um, my opinion is everyone needs to be, everyone should be looking at things that are 800 square feet and above, uh, because under that is really tough. I think that's where, that's where we see, uh, at least in DC, um, a lot more movement, unless of course it's a, a voucher program type of deal. Yeah, and, and actually, if I could just uh, thank you for teeing that up, Connor. Uh, in some of the fringe areas of the city where I own my personal investments and my, my, my landlord friends do, the amount of Section 8 inquiries has gone through the roof. Now, it, it's obvious, right? There's, there's a lot of money put into the market by the government. That money is in people's hands. What are they doing with it? Uh, there's also a lot more social programs, right? Whatever you believe on it, that's the reality. So to, to whether you are or aren't a Section 8 landlord, it, the, the weeding through that can be challenging. And what I saw for a little bit was the quality of tenant, when I say quality, you know, credit score income dip because interest rates were so low that people were buying and that's great. The last couple weeks, three weeks, four weeks, month, you know, two months, there are people who like, I look at on paper, I'm like, why aren't you buying a house, right? Like you have money, your credit score is not bad. And they just, they don't think they can afford it. So selfishly, I love that. I'm, I'm getting to pick from the cream of the crop. That was not the case for the last 18 months or so. All right. Uh, Ryan. What's Mr. up? Arch, are you unmuted? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? You're a little muffled, but I can hear you fine. Todd, can you hear him? I can. What's up, Ryan? What's up, guys? Sorry if I sound like crap. I'm actually uh, finishing up a bout of COVID at the moment, so but feeling better today. So, so what's cooking in the mortgage world? What do you see happening this year, except for <laughs> rising rates? Well, I can show you a chart. You want to see a chart? Yeah, because <laughs> um, it's cooking. Let's put it that way. Um, interest rates are going through the roof right now. Um, they are, since the beginning of the year, I would say we've gone from 3.25 to 4% on a primary residential, uh, property. Um, there's a lot going on with second homes. If, um, as far as rates that world. So let me just show you a chart real quick. If I can pull this thing up. Am I able to share my screen? You should be. Let me see if I can share this. Uh, can you guys see my yes. screen now? Yeah. Okay. So this is the mortgage-backed security market. So these are mortgage bonds. So mortgage bonds are bonds that are backed by mortgages and the prices and interest rates are inverted. So when this goes down, rates go up. And when this goes up, rates go down. Um, and you can see like normal movements in the market are kind of small. And then obviously you can see this is since the start of the year, it's just been a cliff. So, you know, the mortgage world is a little bit, uh, you know, good things. I would say, obviously refinances are just going to disappear. Um, I've had multiple people call me that want to refinance and, um, you know, they're just one month too late, unfortunately, and it literally doesn't make sense anymore. Um, but the purchase market, 
has been strong since the first of the year. I've gotten a ton of leads. Um, just Monday, I think I pre-approved like seven people. Um, so I think we might see a lot of uh, fence sitters kind of get off the fence and start buying. And But it's hard to tell because we are going into the spring season, which is the start of, you know, usually the busy time. So, um, so I'm not sure what's going to happen with the purchase market. I mean, with how crazy it's been the last two years, you know, even if half of the demand for buyers goes away, it's still a pretty busy market. You know what I mean? If, if instead of, you know, 12 offers on a house, you have six offers on a house, it's still a lot. So personally, I don't think, you know, purchases are going to just disappear. Um, but, you know, maybe prices will level off. Um, you know, I'd be interested to hear in other people's thoughts on prices and values. I mean, I personally don't think that they're just going to drop and, and values are going to go down um, because this is purely a supply and demand market. The demand strictly outweighs the supply. It's, it's not built on, you know, um, false, you know, narratives like 2008 where people were buying houses they couldn't afford, right? So this is a different kind of market. Um, and I personally don't think that, you know, the, the purchase market's just going to disappear. I think even if it does, you know, some people exit the market, some people might enter the market to try and take advantage of rates as low as they are now. Because even though 4% sounds high when you're used to 2.5%, it's still not 8%. And who knows, we might end up there um, with the way this inflation and the Federal Reserve is going. So um, personally, you know, that's my personal opinion. There's nothing embedded in economics there. It's just thoughts and opinions. But um, I'd be interested to hear on other people's thoughts there. Uh, but well, when rates go up, Brian, I mean, it can create a lot of urgency in the market, right? People want to dive in the before they go up higher. But when I got licensed um, in the end of 2006, the rates were 7%. And back then, that was a low rate comparative to, you know, mm -hmm. when they were in the teens and the you know, 80s and 90s. So, I mean, I guess it's relative. 2006 we were was one of the best uh, years ever, right? It was yeah. shortly before one of the worst years ever, but but there was a, a huge demand for houses at 7 8% back then. Yeah. Yep. So, my personal opinion is I think you're going to see values kind of cool off. Uh, I mean, even if we go back just a couple of years ago, what's 2018, I want to say 19, rates were up four and a half, five percent almost right? When, when the Fed was trying to raise rates prior to COVID and values never dropped, they just stopped going up as fast. Um, you know, so it wasn't that uh, the demand went away or people didn't want to buy. There's a huge market, it's called millennials and they all want to get out of their parents' basement eventually, right? Um, so there's a huge delayed demand for housing. And unfortunately, um, there just isn't any available. You know, the, the, the supply is the lowest it's ever been. Builders have a harder time building than in the past when you take into account zoning rules and prices and delays. I mean, um, just the, my contractor the other day said he ordered something from Home Depot. It was supposed to be in in 12 days. It came in in 12 weeks, you know? So um, there's nothing that's going to stop that right now. I personally don't foresee how it ends because, um, you know, with the supply chain. So it's not like there's magically just going to be a lot more houses to buy. Um, and I don't think the demand's going anywhere. So, um, Ryan, if you, uh, I was on a call a few days ago and we were talking about just this and I, I don't have it. I can draw it with my hand. It's like, if you look at the construction curve, it grows like this and the population curve grows like this. And that's about 30 years behind. So to your point, millennials, myself included, first time home buyers, whatever they are, everybody wants to move. Most people want to move. There's just nowhere to go. And, um, you know, like the bucket that I'm in, the bucket you were in, Ryan, before you did is, you know, I live in South Philly. I now have two kids. I got to get out of here. But unless I go to my in-laws house, who I love, not doing it, like I, I have no idea where I could move if the if the need was today. So to support your point, yes, it's it's a challenge. This, so this actually brings up a good point. I'd like to hear, uh, you know, Ryan, your opinion on this. Um, because of the, the lack of supply, well, what I'm seeing is that the purchases of what would be considered a first-time home is being skipped. And people that are going to buy a home are going into that almost a higher price home, that secondary home, because they've been waiting so long and they're willing to spend that money on a home that they like right now, rather than say, hey, let me get started on, on this lower price property to move in. Um, in addition to that, 
<clears throat> one thing that um, that I, I've seen on a different panel I was on was that because people are actually waiting longer to retire um, and there's more money to be made, uh, that people are actually uh, who should be leaving their you know large nest house to go elsewhere are staying in those houses longer because they're staying working. That's where a lot of the supply um, would be coming from because that that generation is not moving out to smaller properties after retiring. Yeah, I mean, we've had a unique situation in Philly for a while and with the tax abatement. So, um, you know, it's always been ideal, in my opinion, to buy a new construction versus what's considered a starter home, right? Because you can basically get it for the same price. Um, same you know, payment. With the taxes. Now, I'll be interested to see what the new abatement does to change that. Um, I have noticed, you know, the, the people that are looking for cheaper houses are just not going to find them. Period. I mean, there you can't find a two hundred to three hundred thousand dollar house anymore. It's in Philadelphia, right? Um, you can, uh, but it's going to need work, or it's in an area that maybe um, they don't want to be in. So um, it'll be interesting to see how that shakes out for first time home buyers, because I would say that sixty percent, maybe even sixty five or seventy percent of the people I talk to are first time home buyers, um, and they're the ones that are really driving the, the Philly market. Um, you know, as far as the suburbs, I don't do as much in the suburbs, but it's just crazy out there. I mean, I, th I don't think people are selling their houses in the suburbs because they're scared to death they're not going to find another one to live in. Seriously. Um, I right. mean, it's just nuts. So, um, I mean, I've had people that are 12, 13, 14, 15 offers and still don't have a house out there. Um, and if you're not willing to pay, you know, exorbitant amount over the listing price, you're not even in the ballpark. Um, you know, it's a little bit better now than it was, you know, last year was just mayhem. I mean, I had, I had someone pay a hundred grand over listing price and then wondered if they were going to have an appraisal issue, but, um, <laughs> you know, so, but, but stuff happens, man. It's, it's, but the market is, was crazy. So I think we're going to just be on a road to normalization. I don't necessarily think it's going to be, um, to a downturn. Um, you know, like I said before, I can't, you know, I, the easiest way to explain it is, if you put your house on the market and 12 people put an offer in or six people put an offer in, you're still happy, right? And you still sold it in a day. So, you know, what's the difference? So, Ryan, I don't know who your clients are, but I'm not seeing that on my listings in the city at all. I mean, it happens <laughs> very, very rarely. The and city is thinking... a little, little weird because um, the supply is limited and the supply that's available is not as good quality recently, I've noticed. So I'm getting a lot of pre-approvals, but not a lot of offers. Yeah, I mean, I'm not seeing generally a supply issue at all. I, it depends on the neighborhood, of course, but I mean, I have listings that are competing with 30 other properties, 40 other properties. So I don't know. Um, Ryan, working in the wrong part of town. Ryan, how many of your pre approvals are for people already living inside of Philadelphia, or how many, and how many are from are moving into the Philadelphia area? Oh, it's been a, a mix. Over the last two years, I've had everything from people leaving the city to go to the Poconos to people from New York coming to Philly to, you know, people that already live in Philly and just want to get, you know, as you guys were talking about earlier, just can't stand their one bedroom condo during lockdown and need a house instead. Right. So they're just moving to the other side of town. Um, so, you know, it's just been a mix. I, I can't say that, you know, any I can't. There's a lot of people moving to Philly, too. I mean, I get a bunch of people. I just had one the other day someone moving from California. I've had some second homes. It's, it's really just a mix of everything. Um, most of it is, you know, people from the area, maybe that are renting already and want to buy. Um, but, you know, there's definitely people coming from all over the place for sure. Awesome. All right, Elaine. I'm going to ask to unmute her. No, she sent a message. I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. I'm listening. <laughs> All right. So what can you add to this conversation from a title perspective? Regarding Philadelphia? Regarding the market. Yes. Okay. Well, first off, um, recording is in Philly is really uh, four months behind. So if you have anyone who's looking to get in, jump and get out, they have it's just really tough right now um what if they do what if they want to do that i mean is that a huge problem 
Can, is it well, possible? It, it's, it, it is kind of possible, but I would not highly suggest it. In all honesty, so much can happen at, at, at the city level. And until they can get caught up on that backlog, you really need to let those deeds get recorded, especially if there's something on record that could affect, um, you know, lean wise affect you or somebody could, unfortunately, somebody could sell it to you and somebody else and you had no idea somebody else owns it before you, that deed finally gets recorded. You already thought your deed was going in. You're getting, you're doing your repairs. You're doing your, your flip. And technically another deed was in front of you and you, nobody knew it. And the seller was not, the seller was a little savvier than you. And now you have a claim that you have to fight. Wow. So you're saying if somebody flips the property and they're, they've are they got the flip done in four and a half months and the deed's not recorded, they're not going to be able to sell it or at least you're not going to be able to insure the title? It's not that. Well, I would, I would have to say it's a case-by-case -case basis, Matt. We really have to look at what's going on. If we did the purchase and now we're doing the out sale, that's a completely different conversation. Okay. You know, if we did your purchase and then now you're ready to sell it, and you're you have a buyer come along and say, hey, listen, if you know if we go through my title company, we know where we are, we know what they insured, we know what they researched, and then we can do the out sale. I mean, that's probably the best way to handle something like that until that backlog is caught up. Got it. I think that's really good information. What else? Um, I'm sorry. How about I water bills? The, I jumped into this meeting halfway through. I was putting out a fire that has me a little. I, I know you guys never have any fires in anything <laughs> you do, right? Like all yeah. your transactions are super smooth. There's no people living in South Africa and not having ID anymore, right? Nobody oh, come has on, issues. Elaine, don't be disclosing my, you know, personal grievances. <laughs> you, you didn't have a buyer like that. Why? I don't know what you're talking about. I mean, <laughs> so, a seller. <laughs> this isn't the, um, so this isn't related to the market, but it, it is related to what you were just talking about. So are you just saying the same thing with like water, right? It's like title transfers and it takes the same amount of time for the water bills to go over and all of that sort of stuff as well? No, not necessarily. The water isn't too bad. The only thing we really have to watch for is meter replacement still with the city. Um, we had to have down our process. We have our people who, you know, have built really good relationships with the people in the, in the city that were able to get certain information in a timely fashion, um, which, you know, takes years to to cultivate, but PGW, water, uh, sewer, trash, we it, that's not taking us a ton of time to get it over. Now, I can't tell you how fast the city themselves are updating their own records. That's what I'm talking um, about. But me getting <laughs> information. Yeah, that's what I was talking about, because I have clients who are getting water bills from the previous owner like six months after the fact, and and it just is what it is, right? You just forward it on. It is because a lot of times that deed transfer is where they get their information from. So if a deed is held up for months, you know, you have that four months and then you have to go, then it gets transferred over the to the, the information gets sent to the Water Bureau, then they update their records, but they have a backlog because, you know, there's a million deeds going through the system. So um, it does... It does take some time for the name to update, but in all honesty, the, the time period's on there and it, if someone's in the in the property, it's it's their water usage, it's their bill. Yeah. All right, cool. Sorry, I'm having a hard time hearing you. That's why I was like, what? That's okay. That's okay. All right, guys. So who else has questions, comments? Um, Actually, I have a question. Yeah. So given that there's so many buyers out there, like how are folks doing uh, a buyer presentation? 
you know, before you just randomly take people out, are you demanding pre-qualification letters? Like, I'm, I'm curious as to what the protocol is. Depends on how badly you want the business, Sean. You know, those standards go down the more you need that money, right? <laughs> Very true. Um, I don't work with a lot of buyers. Who can answer that question? I always pre-qualify my buyers because otherwise you're wasting everybody's time. Because if they don't qualify and they're looking at $300,000 houses and they can only afford one hundred and fifty. dollars you wasted everybody's time. So I, I do do the interviews. I'm like, well, you know, get pre-qualified. Let's see. And I phrase it like, let's see how much house you can afford. And then we can really go shopping. So you're not like, well, you know what I mean? So I don't put them down. Mm -hmm. I just say, hey, let's find out how much house you can afford. Hey, and then we'll go find that house. Hey, guys. It's uh, Gordon Stein. I'll, I'll comment on that, Sean. I, I've worked with a lot of buyers over the years and I think to Matt's point, it's all relative to, uh, I think, where you are in your, in your business or your needs and just starting out, or you're more experienced where you don't really you know, need to take a $100,000 buyer out on a Friday night that's not pre-approved kind of thing. Uh, so with that being said, I think it depends on where the buyer comes from is important. If this is a referral that was sent to you or a past client, I think you have a little bit more leeway in asking for that stuff because you can probably build a little bit more trust and rapport from the start versus like a random Zillow lead that comes in where you're going to have to meet them at that property just to build that rapport in person. You're not going to be able to really pre-qualify and ask for a pre-approval letter on that lead coming through on that first phone call. So I think just being, you know, everything's kind of relative to, to that buyer. I mean, if it's a million dollar buyer and they want to see a property, maybe you're more inclined to you know, go out on a Friday night to meet that person versus a hundred thousand dollar buyer. But yeah, with me, I, I pre-qualify everyone that I can, but you don't want to lose that relationship and piss someone off. So you, you kind of walk a fine line on making sure that uh, you handle it correctly, I would say, if that helps. That's great feedback, uh, Gordon. Thank John, you. When in doubt, blame it on the listing agent. Mr. Buyer, the listing <laughs> agent has required a pre-qualification to come through the house. I hate to ask you this, but I can't bring you in. And, you know, just blame it on the listing agent. I'll take the blame. I blame you for everything anyway, so thank you. <laughs> this is true. Thank you. That was great feedback. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, as we wrap up here, Connor. So, Connor, so every one of you know, Connor runs a grid group in, is it Arlington? Oh, sure. It's close. Uh, okay. Well, one of those... You know, Metro Rob, Rob does Arlington. <laughs> yeah. So, how do you guys network at the end of your meetings? Because it's something that we haven't been doing in this group, but I think it would be—I mean, it would be beneficial to to do that. Yeah. Um, so we do one of one of two things, uh, depending on the size of the group. Either we go around uh, real quick and just say, you know, who we are, what we do, and what we're interested in, um, and then drop our our name and our email in the chat because at the end of the day. Um, you know, GRID itself was meant to be a networking, you know, a learning networking event and not being able to be in person really takes away from the networking aspect of it. And you never know um, in, in our in our meetup in, in uh, Virginia, people are doing deals all the time together. And that's what this is about is to, to bring people together to do a deal, um, to sell a deal to someone else so that in three months time, we can talk about how that deal went. Um, so, I mean, I can start and we can kind of go around the room um, mm -hmm. and I'll drop my information in um, into this chat and then we can just keep going like that. And that's kind of- And Connor, I have all the information also recorded in the Zoom link too. So I've got a roster of anybody who's ever joined these meetings and I can always blast that out to anybody. Just shoot me an email and I'll share it with you. Awesome. Um, well, yeah, I, I'm Connor. Uh, I'm with Washington Capital Partners. We're a hard money lender out of um, Virginia, we lend DC, Maryland, Virginia, uh, Pennsylvania for, you know, Pittsburgh and Philadelphia, Jersey, obviously would like to stay closer to Philadelphia than going to New York. Um, you know, uh, we do anything from single, uh, 50 K single family condo to a 96 unit, <laughs> multifamily project. Um, we have acquisition and construction loans and 30 year financing for all of those things. Uh, so that is me, and then I will I will pass it to whoever wants to go next. 
Let's go to the left, Todd. My name is Todd Miller. Uh, I've been I'm a co-leader of Grit with Matt, so I appreciate all the attendance today. Uh, my primary focus is to buy property and hold them as a landlord. I'm an agent as well. And uh, I, th I think I know most of you on this call, but I will provide my contact information. If you're considering buying your first rental property, I would be honored to help you. Uh, I'm so passionate about helping other landlords grow their businesses. I'm a big believer in the abundance mindset here. Uh, I, I was on a plane recently, a lot of houses out there. So I'm help the more I help you, the more you help me. So nice to have you all here and thank you. Ryan. Hey guys, uh, Ryan Harsh with My City Mortgage. Um, so we're mainly a residential lender. Anything you know, one to four units, primary, second homes, investment properties. Um, so anything we can do to help you on that front. So you know, like I said, we work with mostly first-time buyers and investors. I'm an investor too, um, so I love helping out with those kinds of things, whether it's buying, rehabbing, and keeping, or flipping, or anything like that. You know, always love talking to people about it. So. Um, anything we could do to help, give us a shout. Cool. Um, hey guys, I'm Matt, uh, Matt Green. I think everybody knows me and I'm honored to be co-leading with Todd. Thank you guys for joining all of us. Um, I have a, a big investor clientele. If anybody has off-market deals, whether it's shells to flip or vacant land, contact me. I may have a buyer. Um, if you're an agent and you need help doing ARV projections, um, you know, I don't want to brag about this, but I tend to be OCD and, and have a really good track record at creating big, big profits for investors who flip. Um, so, um, and if you are an investor hearing this and looking to get into flipping, um, come talk to me, email me, call me. I can assist you with that and make you very, very rich. <laughs> <laughs> that's the best pitch there is that's right <laughs> Basha why don't you go next um, hey everyone um, my name's Basha Bubel I'm an agent at Keller Williams Philly I'm also an agent in New Jersey I my dream is to have a real estate empire um, but I'm very slow and steady so I only have one duplex so far I have an amazing Airbnb property in the Catskills. Um, and I am, you know, I'm very strict with my numbers. So I'm going to wait until the market in the suburbs cools, dips, and then I'm going to acquire um, some more properties. But I primarily work with buyers. I'm looking to uh, work with more sellers this year. Yeah, I'd love to hear that, Basha. Sean, Don. We skip Dave and we skip Michelle. I think I don't know. Maybe our stuff's in different order. I'm just like, yeah, top, whatever. That's fine. What, Matt, you lead it. Go ahead. <laughs> Michelle. Are you, Michelle, you just muted yourself. Hold on. So I'm an agent in Caldwell Banker, Philadelphia, newly licensed down in Bentner, New Jersey. So I'm trying to work the city and the shore. And as in my tagline, everything in between, I just want to become a smarter agent and get better at this. I do want to, my goal this year is to become an investor. So that's why I'm on here. And I just love learning everything from Todd and Matt. I can't get enough. So thanks, guys. I appreciate oh, love it. Love that. Thank you. David. Uh, hi, Dave Townsend, Global Banker Realty. Um, I uh, do not invest yet. I, it's something I want to do in the future. Um, I've been building myself up back financially. Um, have a possible project in Jersey, um, but I have not fixed and flipped or fixed and held any property. So total newbie here. We'll get you started. That's what this um, is. I, I will drop my email and I will get yours. Um, I have talked to hard money lenders. I'm, I'm considering all options. I'm really open. Great. To all agents out there, I, you know, I want to give a piece of advice. Um, you know, grab an agent friend of yours if you're going to be 
buying a property for the first time, you know, representing you. Should, I mean, you can represent yourself. It's fine on the agreement of sale. That's, you know, you should, but um, I'm always happy to help out friends and give a second set of eyes. Um, you know, I had a really, really good friend of mine buy property in Passion Square that he is regretting buying big time because, oh my gosh, my lights just got really, really bright. Um, anyway, yeah, that's it. Sean? Hi, uh, I'm Sean Doan. I'm with OCF Realty. Uh, I started my real estate career doing rentals and, and a lot of rentals uh, and rentals at Temple University. So I'm interested to learn. So basically from, from the tenant side. So I'm, I'm, this fascinates me from learning from the investor point of it. So, so thank you, Todd. Thank you, Matt, uh, and the lenders as well, and my peer agents for, for all this information. Gordon? Hey, guys. I'm Gordon Stein. I'm a broker with Compass in Center City. Um, I've been in the real estate business uh, for, since I was 18 years old in Philly. I have a small portfolio of rental properties. I've, I've done some rehabs uh, over the years, but my, my main kind of bread and butter uh, pay the bills is real estate sales. Um, so I represent a lot of buyers, um, kind of tr trending more towards listings in the recent years, but I, I do a lot of new construction in like the River Wards neighborhoods. So Fishtown, Kensington, Port Richmond, I have a lot of uh, new construction experience, uh, which kind of leads me to you know, always wanting to learn more and being a part of groups like this and networking. I think one thing I'm really trying to get uh, out of this group is to meet you know, like-minded individuals that you know, want to do the same thing, but also, you know, get some help. I'm, I'm really interested in learning more about short-term rentals personally. I, I don't have any Airbnb properties. Most of my rentals are all long-term, you know, one-year one -year tenants. Uh, and also, I've never done ground-up new construction. I, I've re rehabbed plenty of properties over the years, but I, I'd love to speak to anyone that has, you know, new construction ground-up experience. Uh, I represent a lot of developers and builders, but have never actually you know, done new construction myself. So uh, Airbnb and new construction are two things that I'd love to learn more about. Um, and I'm happy to help talk to anyone if, if they have any questions about the sale side, you know, the, you know, any, really any neighborhood in the city, but uh, the Fishtown area is where I have a lot of experience. Gordon, you'll want to take a look at AirDNA. Um, what is it called? I'm sorry. AirDNA.com. Okay. Um, that's what lenders are using to evaluate uh, rental rates for short-term rentals. I'm actually underwriting my first one this week um, to try to put that program together to get that out in the next two months. Awesome, Connor. Thank you. Carrie? Oh, I wasn't expecting to speak. <laughs> Um, my name is Carrie. Um, I work for WCP as a business uh, development representative. So I've literally only been with, um, with WCP for, I'm thinking going on my fourth week now, Connor. Is that correct? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. We're on my fourth week. So, um, I enjoyed this meeting just to get to know a little bit more about the market and, um, more about Philly as well. Cause I'm definitely not, um, knowledgeable in that area. So um, thank you guys for your time. And Connor, thanks for inviting me on. So don't have much to give to you guys with that one. <laughs> thank you. Thanks for joining. Thank you. Grand feet. Susie. All right. Anybody that hasn't spoken yet. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Well, this was, I don't know about you. It was really helpful for me. So thank, thank you to everybody. Thank you to Connor uh, for being a sponsor, to Elaine and to Ryan for supporting us. Thank you, Todd, as always. Um, our next meeting is on February 17th. The topic is how to find the deal. Uh, but I did write down, um, Gordon, that you're interested in new construction and Airbnb. That's a topic I'd love to cover as well because I really don't have a lot of exposure to that. So um, Todd, me and Connor can maybe do a little bit of uh, digging on that and perhaps get a guest Matt, speaker to help guide us through that process. Hey Matt, if you guys want a uh, speaker for Airbnb, I've got an awesome one. He's a property manager for uh, Airbnb and he probably manages a couple thousand properties. 
in Philly, that, up and down the East Coast. Wait, who's talking? Is it Dave? Harsh. What? Ryan Harsh. Oh, Ryan. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, Ryan, let's talk about that offline for sure. And if before everybody hops off, if you have any ideas or suggestions for topics for these calls, please let Matt, myself, Connor, Elaine, Ryan know because uh, this is for you, right? So you go see idea, we'll build it, but please help us think of some ideas. Contractors. Can we talk about finding <laughs> contractors or not getting, not getting burned by contractors? That'd, that'd be a good one. Gordon, I don't know how many times you and I can circle that drain, man, but I'm in. Let's do it. <laughs> Here's to that. Uh, awesome, everybody. Thank you. Have a yeah, great week. Talk to you next month. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.